So I'm Christopher Dorabeck. I uh, am the uh, uh, afternoon anchor on a radio station here in Washington, D.C. called Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Um, if you're a longtime D.C. person, you probably still have a preset for what was WTOP. WTOP is our sister station. Um, they're the folks who, you know, who do traffic and weather every 10 minutes, and you get that all the time. Um, we're the folks who, uh, so we were on this uh, station, uh, AM 1050, that basically if you were a dog, you could hear it. And now they actually moved us onto a real station that you can really now hear, and we do federal news all basically all the time. We do Caps hockey at night, but um, and and Washington Nationals baseball. Uh, Seventeen days until opening day. Oh, thank God for that. Um, so outside, but outside of that, those things, it's uh, it's us talking about stuff like this, um, and we're very focused on helping feds do their jobs better. Um, and, uh, and there's, what an interesting time to be in Washington, isn't it? Um, and I think this kind of stuff is exactly some of the things that folks are looking at. Um, you know, cloud computing is, uh, you talk about transparency, <coughs> pardon me, um, it, it, a lot of folks think it's going to be very difficult to get to the kind of transparent environment that we're looking, that the Obama administration wants to get to, that everyone wants to get to um, in our current framework. Um, and so a lot of folks are looking at transparency. These gen good gentlemen have uh, put together this big paper, which I, I got to read overnight. Uh, we'll have copies of it right out front uh, after, your, uh, after we're done, so you can, you can read the whole thing for your, for your own self. A lot of interesting stuff in here, including a whole chapter on um, uh, the government space and what the government should be doing. So really interesting stuff. How this is going to work, this is very interactive. So we're a small group, we're, we're all, no one's, everyone promises not to bite anyone else, right? Um, so we're going we're gonna to do a couple of presentations first, but very short, like 800 slides. So it's, it'll be very, very fast. No, we're going to keep slides to a minimum um, and, um, and basically just have a conversation up here. And very, very quickly, we're going to invite you to join us. And here's a little encouragement, because no one likes to ask the first question. So the person who asks the first question, you get a prize. How's that? I bring a prize with me, and you get a prize if you ask the first question. So that'll encourage you. Um, and what a luminary panel we have. Um, let me quickly introduce them. Uh, Jeffrey uh, Rayport is uh, the chairman of Market Space. Andrew Hayward is Market Space uh, senior advisor. And then uh, Bernard Golden is CEO of Hyperstratus, right? And so we're literally going to just have a little conversation up here about this report, about this white paper, what it means, what it means to you, how it helps you do your job better, and then we're going to open it up and allow you to talk. So should we just do that? Shall we just do that? There we go. That sounds great. Right. All right. Now, first of all, I just want to say my name is Jeffrey Rayport, colleague Andrew Hayward. Hi. So thank you all for being here. We are very appreciative to Google for sponsoring this event today in this beautiful place, the museum. Chris, are you going to be okay just standing? I'm, I'm happy. I'll be. You're really all right. Yeah, yeah I was sit over there, and I'll, I'll come back. Okay. Go. All right. So, so, uh, and you all are relaxed and adequately caffeinated to uh, see a few PowerPoint slides. Okay. I just want to start out by saying that um, Andrew and I do apologize for being a bit overdressed for this event. Uh, looking out at you, you're obviously a very casual crowd. I think what we were talking before, I mean, really the only excuse is that at Harvard Business School, this is what we call business casual. So I uh, just wanted you to know there's a little cultural difference here. And I, I just also hope that, you know, since at least, well, both of us have Harvard affiliations, you wouldn't hold it against us that we trained everyone at AIG. And, um, you know, I hope there's no too much public anger. It, at least you'll, know, you'll be happy to know at the Harvard Business School campus, the joke going around is the question of what the difference is between an AIG banker and a pigeon. And the answer is, a pigeon can still make a deposit on a Mercedes. Uh, so I uh, just want you to know, we have a little sense of humor and, of course, um, uncharacteristic I'll, I'll Harvard humility. Little, little sense of humor. Yeah, yeah very little. Uh, humility is also hard to come by up there, but uh, there's a tiny bit of it creeping into the environment. So what we wanted to do this morning, uh, as Chris indicated, is really to have a conversation. Um, we'll start by giving you just a 15-minute, very quick overview 
Uh, I know all of you don't see enough PowerPoint slides in your day jobs, and as a result, we provided some to try to compensate. So we'll just start out with a few of them to give you an overview of the paper. Um, Dorothy, I'm just wondering if we can bring down the floodlights here. We realize that the screens in front of you are a little bit small, and to make the slides more re readable, what we've done is to put them on the big screen here and then turn a bunch of spotlights on on the big screen to make sure you couldn't read them. So let me just start off by saying that um, what we're here to talk about today is something that for those of you in the technology community will be very familiar, and for those in the policy community who've been following this, this is a story that is many of you know has unfolded over many decades. I mean, that is that it seems as if every decade or so, uh, we see a new paradigm in the world of computing. We think about the 50s and 60s as the mainframe era in which some of you, if we're old enough to remember, dealt with dumb so-called time-sharing <coughs> terminals that we fed paper tapes with little perforations or magnetic tapes later on. Then the mini-computer revolution came along and put Route 128 around Boston on the map with companies like Prime and Wang in the 1970s. The 80s and 90s, of course, saw the PC revolution. The 90s and 2000s saw the internet revolution. Um, each of these, you could argue, was a shift, a major shift in the paradigm for how we as consumers, organizations, institutions, businesses, for profit and non, make use of computing. And we're here because we believe that the cloud is, uh, to use that phrase that Chris, I'm sure you used on your radio show, is the next big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you've never used it? All the time. Okay, AM 1500. So let me move us along simply by saying that what we will try to share, and uh, as Chris indicated, it is available in two forms for you. One is a detailed white paper available for download as a PDF. Also, please do not become alarmed if you see text on these slides. Um, these slides will be available as a PDF download along with that paper, uh, along with executive summary and so forth. So we, this morning, will talk about what is the cloud anyway, what do we believe the benefits are? What will it take to enable it? And some of the enabling, as Bernard and others will be talking about, maybe on many of your minds, is the issue of what are the risks inherent in the cloud? What's government's role from a policy-making perspective in terms of what it will take for the cloud to become a positive reality? And finally, some concluding thoughts. So let me start simply by saying that uh, we believe the basis of cloud computing can be summarized in three laws. One is Moore's Law. You'll see a picture of Gordon Moore, the famous pioneer of the semiconductor industry, who wrote an article little noticed at the time that coined a term in the technology community called Moore's Law, the idea that processing power per unit price doubles uh, in an average or general sense every 18 months. Many of you in the technology industry know that we're now dealing with an accelerated version of Moore's Law on an eight or nine month cycle. The second law is a little less well known, named after Mark Kreider, uh, a leading or pioneering technologist in the field of storage who had a similar observation. That is, that storage capacity per unit price doubles not every 18 months, but every 12 months. And for any of you who have little tiny thumb drives in your pocket that have two gig memories on them or are walking around with an 80 gig iPod, you know that storage has become very small, very cheap, very fast. It's part of the reason that most of you are you all carrying mobile devices? Could we just see a show of hands? Uh, is there anyone who's here without a mobile device? My God. I lost mine at South by Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. That is a great answer. Are you having any withdrawal symptoms right now? Oh, he has, uh, his, he has his Macintosh open, okay. and, and there is Wi-Fi in the room, so you're not unconnected. Okay. So this is actually a fascinating point here, which goes to the third law, which is known as Grove's Law, and that is the fact that, you know, you think about it, it was only 10 or 15 years ago that any of us who wanted to get online had to dial up. Dial up meant the same thing that picking up a phone meant, which is that we were unconnected as a rule and being connected was the exception. And of course, today we live in a world, thanks to the fact that Grove's Law has not held up, in which being connected is the rule and being unconnected is the exception. And it looks like with our friend who substituted his, his Macintosh his MacBook on Wi-Fi for his mobile device. We are 100% connected here all the time throughout the session, hence the importance of short codes, Twitter, and tweets, and so forth. Grove's Law, just for the record, was the idea that the world's bandwidth, that is, its communications bandwidth or its connectivity, doubled every 100 years. Now, he was slightly off. 
uh, slightly off partly because of the fiber optic revolution that happened over the dot-com boom, even though big companies like Global Crossing imploded in the tech meltdown in the last recession, which seems like a walk in the park compared to this one. The fact is the world is now rich in high-speed connectivity and bandwidth, and that has given rise to uh, what is the very basis of cloud computing, otherwise known as the data center. And this is a picture just to show you how dynamic and exciting a data center can be. Um, We're going to tour one right after the session. Yeah, absolutely. You, you can see that obviously local job creation is quite significant here. You can see all the employees enjoying their jobs. In any event, um, we'll get back to that a little later. This is one of the issues here. Uh, but the data center essentially reflects the fact that when connectivity becomes fast, ubiquitous, and inexpensive, it becomes less and less necessary for us as individuals to walk around with powerful machines or with large capacity for storage. And that's the fundamental idea. Please forgive this slide. It's the one very text heavy slide. We wanted to include it. It's obviously in the white paper. But let me just uh, read it for those of you who are using it as an eye chart. Um, we have obviously talked to a lot of experts, reviewed a lot of literature, and this we propose as a definition, since there are many, many definitions of cloud computing out there, that it re represents a new way to deploy computing technology to give users the means to access, to work on, to share, collaborate, store information using the internet. And of course, this is the always on broadband high speed internet. The cloud itself, just to be concrete about it, itself is a network of data centers. These data centers, as you just saw in the previous picture, are each composed of thousands, in some cases tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of machines working in parallel that essentially can perform the functions of small and large computers, personal or business computers, by providing users access to applications, applications like Word, PowerPoint, and so forth, the typical office productivity suite, platforms, meaning development environments, and, of course, services and infrastructure, now all accessible over the Internet. So there's our dictionary definition. It is a humble proposal, and we may want to challenge aspects of this. But the point for us that is a very important one is that the cloud, while uh, you know, there are regions across the country, Silicon Valley being one, where the cloud is not just the next big thing, it is the thing. Uh, it's what everyone is talking about and takes for granted. Out here, you talk about cloud computing uh, up and down the East Coast, and some people look at you cross-eyed. The fact is, the, there are vast mass markets of consumers who are living in what we define as the cloud today. So, for the 175 million active users of Facebook, the 300 million registered users of MySpace, these are cloud computing services. The same for photo sharing, for online music, online video, sites like YouTube serving 150 million video streams every 24 hours. And of course, anyone who's got a smartphone, like an iPhone, is dealing with what you might argue is the ultimate cloud device. So irony here. On one hand, this sounds like a terribly arcane and abstract topic. And on the other hand, actually hundreds of millions, arguably on a global basis, billions of consumers, since 1.5 billion of us are actively connected out of 6.7 billion on Earth to the Internet, are actually already in the cloud and using the cloud today. The final point to make, and this is just, uh, if you will, the technical angle uh, on the cloud, is that there really are three flavors or variants of the cloud. The most familiar is this first one, which we think of as a user level definition of the cloud that some people call SaaS or software as a service. Every time you do a Google search query or use salesforce.com to review how your office development is doing or to go to Zillow to look at a bunch of mashups between what's happening in the local real estate market and what's happening in local neighborhoods, every one of these represents a cloud service that is appealing to consumers or individuals as users. The same thing goes for the, all of the applications on social networking sites. The second level of the cloud is what we think of as the platform level. So platform as a service or PaaS. Uh, I did want to say that PaaS is a four letter acronym that nobody uses, so we call it platform as a service. This is a development environment that is streamed over the internet, accessible through the web. Uh, Many of you will know that in the mid in 2008, Microsoft made a splash, or at least attempted to, by developing its or introducing its Azure platform for development. Probably the most uh, successful one from a business applications perspective this is an extension of Salesforce.com, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that uses a platform called Force.com 
to give developers, again, a cloud-based development environment in which they can build very sophisticated functionality that is not only developed in the cloud, but can be hosted in the cloud. And the last level of cloud computing is either the IT level or the infrastructure level, which is otherwise known as infrastructure as a service. This is what Amazon has made a big splash around with Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2 with its simple storage service or S3. What they're essentially saying is that Amazon is not a retailer, it's not a book and music company, it's actually a technology company. As a technology company, it's built vast capacity in its data centers, therefore there's ex excess capacity that is now available on a streamable basis from the standpoint of storage and raw That's actually processing a, power. A great point. One reason the cloud grew is that Google and Amazon and other companies had excess capacity after building these data centers for their own core businesses. Google for search and Amazon for e-commerce, and they had these server networks that then could be used for these other purposes. So on that note, Andrew, I'm going to turn this control right over to you. Uh, what do I click to move forward here? This thing? Right hand side. Perfect. Okay, okay, so we're going to quickly go through some of the, we've identified in the paper, and these are kind of elastic definitions, uh, some of which overlap, as you'll see, uh, and benefits and enablers of the cloud. So, so the first is a very obvious one, which is anytime, anywhere access. Uh, all you have to have is a device that gets access to the internet and you can access uh, software as a service. The, uh, we're lots, there are lots of examples, the papers replete with them. One of them Jeffrey mentioned is uh, salesforce.com, which just became uh, the first cloud-based service to generate a billion dollars in sales. It's a customer relationship management uh, service that's been really a pioneer in using cloud-based services. Um, specialization and customization is what Jeffrey referred to as the developer layer. These are sophisticated, targeted applications built on cloud infrastructure. An example here is Aptis, which is a contract and proposal management firm. It was built on Salesforce's infrastructure platform called Force.com, or, or, or development platform rather called Force.com, and, and the, the, the CEO of Aptis, who's quoted in the paper, told us that uh, they built their application uh, and became profit in, in, in a matter of a couple of weekends, became profitable within nine months. His estimate was it would have taken at least nine months on their own to start from scratch. They saved enormous amounts of time and money, and actually, I mean, he's become a, a cloud evangelist uh, uh, based on that experience. Um, <clears throat> collaboration, very obvious, if everyone can access uh, everyone in your company, anyone in your organization can access the material on the internet. It's easy to collaborate. Anybody who's had the nightmare of version control when you mail each other traditional documents and figure out, wait a minute, did Lisa change this or is it my turn, uh, knows that collaboration in the cloud is easier. We have, cite the example of IBM, which had this uh, innovation jam with 150,000 participants from 104 countries. Obviously, it doesn't have to be uh, that dramatic. We actually collaborated in the cloud to write the paper, and uh, it's, it's really a dramatic difference from <clears throat> the way things have traditionally been. <clears throat> These next two examples overlap. One is storage as a universal service, uh, and, and the other is computing power on demand. Uh, the New York Times and Amazon is an example of, of both. The New York Times wanted to digitize its archive going back to the 1800s. Again, like Aptis, had it chosen to do that on its own, it would have been, well, it wouldn't have because it would have been prohibitively expensive and complex. And they actually did try to do it on their own and gave up after a few weeks. I didn't even know that, but there you go. So, so the, whereas uh, using Amazon's uh, cloud infrastructure, <coughs> storage and processing power, the Times was able to digitize 150 years of archives. So when you go back and look at a New York Times story from the 1800s to the 1900s, you're actually on Amazon's storage capacity and on, on, on Amazon's servers, and it was just much cheaper. Back, it made it feasible, as Jeffrey said. It wouldn't, could not have happened uh, without that. And as I mentioned, processing power on demand is the other function that, that, that Amazon provides to the Times. Uh, here's a company called Animoto, <coughs> which is a, it's a small company. It's actually based in New York, uh, they, they share offices with, with pals of mine there, um, and then they suddenly exploded in popularity because of a uh, Facebook marketing campaign that succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. So suddenly, instead of 5,000 people a day, they had to service 750,000 a day, so they added capacity on demand on Amazon Web Services. The notion here is instead of having to build infrastructure that supports you for your peak periods, the Christmas season, let's say, if you're, if you're a retailer, you can access processing power when you need it, as Animoto did when this Facebook marketing campaign exploded, then was able to scale back because it's processing power um, on demand. But let me elaborate uh, oh, please, on the New York Times uh, example, because this really yeah. identifies what's going on with the cloud. So um, they did try and do it kind of the traditional way, and the guy who was assigned for the project Got, you know, went to the IT organization, they said, well, it'll probably be a few months, we'll get going on it, and then we'll have to buy all this stuff, and I don't know if we got capacity. And he just looked at it and said, oh, my, you know, it was like millions of dollars. Uh, he found a guy, um, I had an opportunity to hear the guy speak um, last year. Uh, the guy uh, who got assigned the project said, well, let me go try this EC2 thing. 
he went up there, he loaded all the stuff up to S3, uh, used EC2, he used an open source project called Hadoop, which uh, spread it across a number of platforms. He ran the whole thing in a weekend, got finished, it was done, cost $240 total. He put it onto his personal credit card to run this thing. And that's why uh, this stuff is just, you know, people are just saying, this, has gotta, this is something I've got to look take advantage of. And, and just to, to, to pile on further, I mean, just to, to, for, for those of us, at least we've got two former journalists sitting on stage, Andrew from the broadcast world of broadcast news, and for me from magazine journalism. I mean, just think about what Bernard said. So this is 150 years of daily editions of the New York Times. And this was not, this is not a set of ASCII files or text files. These were full pages. You can go back to 1873 and actually look at an entire newspaper advertising it all, fully page composed. It's also fully searchable. So you're not only just, you're not simply looking at PDF or static images. You're looking at searchable text and graphics. Um, it's, it's, it's an almost unimaginable archival task that was performed in, again, under 48 hours. So we have a similar example here, and uh, Bernard, uh, valuable to remind us how cheap it was. Uh, so here's Genentech, which decided to use Google Apps <clears throat> to pro provide productivity software to a workforce of over 16,000 people, and estimated that it saved $80 million by not having to build and staff its own uh, data center to do it. Again, the, the cost savings uh, of, of the cloud are, are also impressive. All that said, we think there are eight factors that, are, that, that need to all con that will contribute to the flourishing of the cloud. The cloud, for all of our enthusiasm, is in its early stages. And there are eight things we think need to happen, and some of them need to happen quite a bit better than they have so far for the cloud to realize its potential. And some of them, as you'll see, do involve an issue that's important to a lot of people in the room, which is what the government's role uh, should be. And Andrew, do, 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 does everyone need a moment of silence just to absorb all those benefits? <laughs> I thought it would be good to feel good about them before we get into some right. of the issues and challenges. Yeah, we're going quickly, so we don't anybody get next strain looking to their left to see that big screen. So we're trying to, again, we're going to not, we're going to glance over these slides and send them to you so you don't have to get a crick in your neck to uh, enjoy the presentation. So the first is universal connectivity. Very obvious. If people can't reach the internet, the cloud doesn't work. And in fact, the, while Jeffrey gave the numbers on the uh, Grove's Law being shattered by the uh, dramatic expansion in connectivity, the U.S as you know very well, is not the world leader by any means. Uh, and this is something that has to change, uh, not only for this country, but uh, for the cloud to work around the world. Uh, the U.S. is only 15th in the world in 2007 in, in broadband penetration and 13th in overall internet connectivity. That, this is an area where government is going to get uh, involved, but, but if, the, if you don't have essentially, or at least close to ubiquitous access to the internet, then the potential of the cloud very obviously does not get realized. And, and Andrew, just to underline that, I mean, many of you will know that South Korea is the world's leading market in terms of broadband penetration. So you're talking about 90 plus percent penetration in homes. That sounds impressive compared to our 50 to 60 percent. What's even more impressive is what they define as broadband is 25 to 50 times faster than what we define as broadband, which is one of the reasons that Seoul has become the world's center of excellence for online gaming, immersive environments, and so forth. So these are very significant uneven aspects of how various country markets or regions of the world are equipped to take advantage of this revolution. Not to throw too many numbers at you at once, but if you look at that quote from the Gartner Group, 500 million in-home consumer broadband connections uh, by 2012, that's just three years from now, but that's only a quarter of the world's households. So a tremendous progress needs to be made there. The second enabler is open access. We are not insane enough to enter the net neutrality debate in a room like this in Washington, D.C., so we will not. Or at least not without a car waiting right out front. Exactly, an armored car waiting out front. But uh, this issue of fair and open and non-discriminatory access, which you know is you know, fraught with politics and with uh, high-stakes corporate interests, is one that uh, obviously has analogies to the cloud. Again, in our view, uh, the cloud doesn't reach its full potential uh, unless... Uh, any player can access it on a fair, non-discriminatory uh, basis. Um, so that's something that, again, will, will be wrapped up if this debate comes back, uh, which it's surely going to uh, under the new administration. Uh, reliability, again, obvious but absolutely critical. This is the notion that the cloud has to work. Uh, there are, uh, you know, even the best known providers of cloud services have had failures, of course, the best known providers of non-cloud services have had plenty of failures too. Uh, the difference is that when it happens in the cloud, everybody knows it. So if Gmail goes down, uh, you know, what it did briefly uh, actually uh, last month, um, you know, the blogosphere goes crazy, says the cloud is doomed. Uh, it, whereas if, if your own server goes down in your company, you know, you grumble about it and IT fixes it and, and nobody really knows. But the fact is <clears throat> the cloud has to be near 100% reliable or 
or it will not catch on. That may sound like a, an unattainable goal. It's not. Uh, it's very close to that now, <clears throat> but that's absolutely critical. If, if it's not reliable, it doesn't work. Interoper interoperability is a more complex one. Uh, in our view, uh, for the cloud to reach its potential, users have to have the choice to move from service to service. There's a very pithy quote from uh, the Salesforce executive, Polly Sumner, uh, even though it's grammatically challenged, uh, it's correct, if a customer doesn't like our service, they can cancel. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the point is that uh, you have to be able to move from cloud to cloud in our view, and there's again, if you think about it, interesting tension there because corporations need to make money. They, they, they have shareholders, so it's in their interest to have something proprietary that locks you in. However, in our view, um, and at least in the stated view of the big cloud providers, they also understand that without the ability to move, to pull your data out, to go somewhere else, the cloud isn't really going to catch on. So that's an issue that's going to have to be resolved. We believe it's going to be resolved by the market, but it's certainly something uh, to keep an eye on. Security, it's related to reliability, but it's a little bit different. That's the notion that your data is safe. We believe that the goal for the cloud uh, has to be a very ambitious one, not just as safe as current systems, but safer. Has to be, that, that cloud providers have to be able to demonstrate that data, in fact, is even safer in the cloud uh, than, than it is now. Uh, because as you, we have a quote here from a, a public servant in California who worked for the Public Utilities Commission, and, and there is quite a bit of, we raise all these issues in the paper, including skeptics who, who get to speak, saying, you know, I, I just, I, I'd be too worried about a security breach. We have too much sensitive data uh, to go to the cloud. So the Carol and Lawson's of the world will have to be convinced that current systems are more like putting your money in the mattress and going to the cloud, more like going to, you know, a, uh, the vault in a Swiss bank, not the bank that, that just was forced to give away all of its uh, information, by the way. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, and privacy is obviously a very, very critical issue. We're not going to have time to get into uh, a deep discussion, although we're happy to address it in the Q&A if you like. Uh, but uh, the laws have not kept up with the cloud. And in the U.S., as many advocates quoted in the paper point out, privacy advocates point out, once you hand your data over to a third-party provider, you don't have the same rights that you do when you're holding it yourself. This obviously has big implications. Uh, yet, again, if uh, uh, there are really two issues, one is, uh, what access does government have to your data? And another one is what, what access do companies have to commercially exploit your data? And those both have to be uh, addressed uh, by some combination probably of the market uh, and, and regulation. Uh, the buzzword you see of accountability and transparency is, uh, again, uh, Dan Burton, who's based here in Washington, also works for, works for Salesforce. Uh, th those are really important concepts, and uh, you, know, you already see the controversies when, uh, you saw the Facebook controversies when the Facebook community in a couple of times already, first over Beacon, then more, more recently over the change terms of service, has risen up to say, wait a minute, we're not comfortable with, with, with what you're doing with our data. Uh, that's going to be an ongoing issue. And by the way, I mean, just worth adding to that, that the, uh, you know, we've talked about data centers uh, as if data centers were somehow monolithic things. I think you all know that the major providers, Google, Amazon, Yahoo, Microsoft, IBM, run networks of data centers, each one of which may have 10,000 or 100,000 servers inside it. So the idea that your information is in one place, either a state within the United States or one national jurisdiction, the United States versus other countries, uh, chances are if the system is operating the way these systems should operate, a phenomenon known as virtualization occurs in which multiple machines are completing single tasks. Multiple machines are not necessarily under the roof of a single data center. So part of the complexity that Andrew's talking about is the fact that you may, in a global cloud provider system, have many dozens of <coughs> legal jurisdictions and regulatory regimes governing what happens to little bits and pieces of your information, which, by the way, um, need to remain private and secure. So right. this is a what's very the, complex yeah, What's issue. the law in Indonesia for my email? Um, Economic value, uh, the cloud is going to have to deliver benefits. Uh, it's already delivering benefits to consumers, uh, free email being a very simple example. Um, but in our view, uh, as the, those benefits have to extend dramatically to first small and medium-sized businesses and then to enterprise. And unless the cloud delivers the benefits we've talked about to enterprise, it's not going to reach its full potential. And final enabler, and I could also have listed this earlier as a benefit rather than an enabler, it's really both, is uh, sustainability. Uh, the cloud has the potential to be uh, ecologically correct, 
Uh, right now, data centers, as you see in that slide, use an enormous amount of electricity. Um, there is the potential with technology, uh, with this consolidation of data centers, to actually do something good for the planet. And we think that's going to be not just desirable, but essential for selling the cloud to the public. Um, so, essentially, just to finish up here and then turn it back over to Jeffrey and also let Bernard chime in, we're showing here a spectrum, please don't take this slide too literally, but this is a spectrum who decides of issues that are going to have to find an equilibrium between policy and the market. And we kind of, you know, we laid them out across this, uh, just to start the conversation, across this grid, but obviously everybody in the room would place them you know, depending on your view of these things, somewhere on this scale. Uh, from cybercrime enforcement, pretty much a government function, uh, government adoption of the cloud, we think is going to be very important as a, as a, as a leader. Uh, universal connectivity, I mentioned earlier. Sustainability is something where we believe the market is also going to have a role. There's going to be pressure on corporations to be more sustainable in their activities. Privacy, we think again, the market is going to be very active, but as I said earlier, I'm, I'm sure there's, we know there's going to be discussion of that on the Hill uh, and, and in the White House in the next couple of years, if not sooner. Uh, security also a blend, and then we, we think that things like interoperability, reliability, and certainly economic value skew towards the market side of the equation, meaning that the market is most likely to determine uh, where, where those end up. Bernard, you wanted to comment on this, right? Yeah, well, sort of what I want to say was, in terms of, you know, we work with end users, CIOs, enterprises, who are trying to figure out, what do we do about the cloud? And uh, kind of in our conversation with them, they typically bring up three areas of concern or risks. And the first is practical. You know, sort of, these are new platforms, how do I program against them? I have processes and products I use for system management, how can I integrate the cloud? And kind of in our view, those are transitory issues because as people learn, as they get educated, as they go through training, as new people join the enterprise, you know, those things will get worked out. And so we sort of, um, I mean, it's kind of, in a sense, a human capital issue that tends to be addressed over time. Um, you, then there's issues of politics and I don't mean Republicans and Democrats. What I mean is um, in every enterprise, as new technologies come along, there are people for whom it helps them do their jobs um, and you know, helps them achieve things. So for cloud computing, it's stuff like, I can get a system built faster, I can scale it better so I'm not constrained by capacity. Those people embrace uh, these changes. There are people who are threatened by it and uh, they tend to resist it, and so if you're somebody who maybe runs a big data center, you're responsible for data center operations in an IT organization, may not be so enthusiastic about cloud computing. And finally, what we hear a lot is policy. You know, what do I do about data? You know, is my data as secure with someone else? Or if it's out in the cloud, who else can get access to it that I don't know about? Things like, can the government get at it in a way that they couldn't if I had it? You know, and I think this is a huge issue. And this is a, from our point of view, so, you know, the, the politics one I think is going to fade away because of the economics. The, the economic value of cloud computing is so compelling that I think that CIO of the Public Utilities Commission is going to eventually be told, figure out what to do about cloud and don't give me those kinds of things. Um, but the policy stuff is not something that individual enterprises can solve. That's something that, you know, I think is really incumbent on the government to sort of figure out. And I, I mean, I, I think it needs to be, you know, a task force or something that starts working on it because this stuff is accelerating in terms of adoption. Um, I blog for CIO Magazine, and my next post, which should be up the next day or so, has a chart on cloud computing employment. And the chart is, a year ago there was nothing in terms of this, in terms of job postings. It is nearly straight up vertical now. Uh, and, and that shows you that people are really moving toward this. And this policy stuff, I think, is a big impediment. It's something that's very confusing, and, you know, this is, you know, my view, the place where the government has a real strong role and really should be moving forward aggressively. Um, All right, so well, that's a good segue to Jeffrey's closing. Uh, oh, uh, sir, uh, sir, please. Absolutely. Uh, yes, please. Adoption. Oh, the, the, the government itself, we think, uh, should adopt cloud services. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know what, we, 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 we wrote that poorly, and you're right to point that out. We should have found a better phrase for that. Uh, technically a question. Yeah, no, that was, uh, it was a good question and I wrote it, so, uh, and Andrew objected at the time, so thank you for you uh, calling me on it. Um, by the way, it just strikes me that in, in follow-up to uh, Bernard's point, I mean, there's a distinction to be made between uh, the building blocks of cap cloud computing that we've been talking about and private versus public clouds. That is that the IT manager who's running a data center for XYZ Corporation is in fact running 
cloud architecture, but within the confines of a single enterprise. In effect, we start getting into these big policy issues that are illustrated here that Bernard is talking about when we start thinking about public clouds or publicly, or what are referred to as multi-tenant clouds um, becoming central to the marketplace. You are a, a great uh, straight man. So the, the uh, posting for the, uh, the blog is... That was actually the segue to my next slide. Uh, <laughs> is no, 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 please. Re recession, good or bad for cloud computing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and it talks about internal versus external stuff. So I think it's a really, I mean, it's a, it's a really a key point. issue. Yeah, so, so we will finish up very fast, which is simply to say that this issue of a cloud ecosystem is of course a public story, meaning again, I mean, we'll, we'll get into this further and I know Bernard will have more to say about this, but the point is, one is data center providers that can run, run multi-tenant systems, and as Bernard says, as we are all under cost pressure, that is pressure to reduce costs and produce savings because of the down economy, uh, being able to outsource to somebody else's data center is a hell of a lot less expensive, especially in capital equipment than running your own. Uh, clearly, uh, media companies, meaning content players, guys who provide information services and data, are part of, a, they are consumers of cloud services potentially, like the New York Times example. They also make the cloud more interesting. Clearly, as Andrew said, we have to have connectivity. So broadband ISPs, telcos, cable companies that provide broadband services need to keep up. And then, of course, device manufacturers need to proliferate the billions of devices, especially mobiles that are already in the hands of the general population, to access the cloud. So these are, in effect, building blocks of what we think of as a cloud ecosystem all of which can either roll out and come together in a public way, more quickly or less quickly, depending on how the market and how policymakers respond to this opportunity. The fact is, as we think about the future of what does it mean to start living with the cloud, the vision here, which we won't go into in any great detail, as I think all of you know, from home automation to software controlled or microprocessor determined performance of automobiles to refrigerators that keep track of what you're eating and tell you not to have that extra Coors Light at 1 a.m. despite the temptation to eat that with a slice of pizza. This is a vision of the world that is essentially predicated on the cloud uh, that some people refer to as pervasive computing. And of course, as we move from 3G to 4G in terms of wireless access, we talk about pervasive computing, we're not talking about wireline connectivity to the cloud, we're talking about a pervasive reach of a high-speed information network, wired and wirelessly, to practically every object we touch in our lives. And so our final uh, 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 comment here is that there is a big blue sky out there, and, and believe me, we really did not intend to create a visual pun, although I must say there's some very beautiful clouds in that sky, but our point is that for uh, the cloud, we believe that as consumers, as we said before, adopt cloud services, aware or unawares, in the hundreds of millions, whether it's email or photo sharing or social networking, um, that this is going to become the new normal. And as Bernard was just saying, not just the new normal for consumers or for small and medium-sized businesses that can't afford to run their own data centers, but the new normal for the big enterprise folks who are looking for ways to increase performance and reliability, lower cost. What that means is we believe that the cloud represents a quite significant avenue for this country, for the United States, as a matter of our own economic future and the growth of our own economy to exercise both commercial and technology leadership on a global stage. That is, it's hard to believe that if we produced the world's best cloud platform from the standpoint of multi-tenant or public cloud providers, that that would not have significant economic advantages for the United States. And as a result, our parting shot uh, is simply this. It's our view uh, as, as part of this work and after the dozens of interviews with cloud experts and our own review of the literature and our own knowledge and expertise from our practice, that this is not a time for rapid fire or trigger happy government intervention, that in fact the cloud marketplace is doing a quite excellent job helping the cloud's potential unfold for individuals, for the SMB segment in business and for large enterprise, and that the best role for government or policymakers to play at this point is, as we put it, to clear the road, to clear the obstacles, to assure universal access to connectivity, to move us into a number one or number two position in terms of ubiquity of connections and the speed of connections, and that is to clear the road, not to pave it. So let me turn the floor back over to Chris. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks very this much. Segment of the program. That's a lot of fodder there, isn't it? Um, I'm just curious, how many people use uh, cloud, some form of cloud computing in their, in their personal life, outside of your work? Almost everyone, right? Uh, how many people use it in your work life? Work lives, okay. 
less, fewer, but uh, still a lot. Um, and uh, and the thing that I always do when we when we talk about cloud computing, because cloud computing has this sort of you know you feel to it. Um, you know, if, if it's Gmail for goodness sakes, you have Gmail. It's not quite quite so scary. Um, and when you think about it, I think in those contexts, um, it's it, it isn't nearly as frightening. Um, can I get you to talk a little bit more, and then we're going to go to them? But uh, talk a little bit more about the government aspect, we, because this is your last chapter in, and it, we got a lot of questions on uh, Google Moderator about this. Um, but particularly, and I'm just going to read one graph here. In contrast, overregulation could create a climate that impedes the cloud's growth. And you talked a little bit of right there at the end, but it's sort of the what kinds, what's what's the create the worst case scenario and the best case scenario for folks. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, for one thing, we've talked a lot about data privacy, about data security, and about access to personal data. And so, one example of clearing the road from a policymaking or a government perspective for cloud computing is to make sure that how data is handled, private data is handled by third parties who are storing our personal data. Say if you upload the archives from your laptop or your PC into the cloud, um, it is uh, an irony that exists in the law today that your rights to privacy with respect to that data are different once that data resides in the cloud as opposed to having the data reside on the hard drive of a piece of equipment called your laptop or your PC that you actually own. That's an example of a problem, meaning that that is an unlevel legal perspective or treatment of an issue that's obviously critical to all of us, whether it's corporate data security or it's individual and personal privacy. So this is what we mean by the notion that uh, there are aspects of universal service mandates, meaning that it's good for everyone to ac have access to the network, aspects of individual rights around data security and privacy. These really are policy issues. And without these being resolved, um, we don't, in fact, have as robust a proposition for the cloud vision that we described so rosily at the front end of our presentation as we might otherwise have. But the other side of the question was, what would overregulation be and how would that impede innovation? So that was the... Uh, Fair enough. I mean, this, Chris, I, I don't want to get into a controversial area, but w w why not? I mean, we're among friends, I, I believe, since all of you seem to be users of cloud computing. Um, you know, um, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, uh, a simple piece of legislation like the Patriot Act, which gives our government, for intelligence reasons, a right without necessarily what we would consider due legal process to reach into data centers to look at otherwise privileged information, that creates an uneven playing field in the following sense. It is a piece of overregulation. We all know where it came from and why. And, and, and it may have noble elements, it may have objectionable elements, but the simple fact is we are now seeing two things happen as a result of this kind of regulation or this kind of regime. One is that data traffic on the internet is being routed around the United States. So the internet was developed here, as you all know, by, as an ARPANET, by DARPA, late 1960s, popularized in the 1990s with the interface called the World Wide Web, we have been the major platform for the world's data traffic. In the last three or four years, that has begun to change. Why? Because of a change in a legal regime that made information passing across US servers as otherwise generic internet data traffic discoverable. By the same token, there are cloud providers, multi-tenant providers or public cloud providers that are looking for safer places to put data centers. For example, one being Switzerland. Switzerland, famous for its privacy with respect to all kinds of things, including bank accounts. My God, if you put a data center in Switzerland, that is not subject to US discovery without due legal process in the way that a data center built in Akron, Ohio might well be. Those are examples of regulatory regimes where governors made decisions that have huge impacts on the viability of the US as a platform for the unfolding of the cloud vision where you might say we are at a competitive disadvantage of a significant to a significant degree as a result of that kind of yeah. government and activity. And let me add something that I think just responds to, to the question in a different way. So the notion of lock-in versus interoperability is one where 
you could imagine overregulation uh, being an impediment. Uh, the, the consensus among the experts we talk to is that for the government to mandate interoperability, or even worse, to actually mandate the exact standards that all cloud providers have to adhere to, could stifle innovation because it, it gets, gets into that tension I referred to earlier between the notion of having something proprietary that draws customers to your cloud but still allows them to move from cloud to cloud is where companies have to end up. So they're going to, as, as government looks at these areas, uh, at the enablers, uh, there's going to have, that's why we showed you that spectrum. There's going to have to be really important considered decisions on where to come down to uh, encourage the enablers without mandating so strictly that you actually stifle the incentive for companies to, uh, uh, to be creative uh, and innovative. And the, you know, one, one way to think about this is that you know, generally in the, the digital media revolution, things that were products are becoming services. And the cloud is a great example of that. In the competitive arena, the more it can move towards service and providing the best service, as opposed to locking you into a particular product, uh, the more successful it's likely to be. And, and one final thing to say on that Oh, score. look, we can hear you. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Yeah. So we have power back. Yes. Thank you. I apologize about that. Um, I was sitting on a dead battery, um, which actually is one of the great ironies here, which is connectivity matters. Right. Um, so uh, just the final thing to say is that the Internet and the World Wide Web are classic examples of cases where the market took care of achieving global consensus around things like Internet Protocol, TCP, IP, et cetera, around HTML and so forth. This was established simply in an organic or market-driven fashion. Um, an example of overregulation would be to come in and decide that there was going to be a unique U.S. standard that other countries around the world might decide for political reasons not to follow, and all of a sudden you'd have a patchwork quilt of connectivity, which is, by the way, why when you get off an airplane in Narita in Tokyo with your BlackBerry device, you find out that all of a sudden you're having withdrawal symptoms like our colleague in the back of the room who lost his mobile device. Uh, because they're on a different standard. In other words, wireless connectivity is slowly but surely uh, becoming hom homogenous or consistent around 3G services around the world, but it's taken 20 years for us to do this. So that's probably more of an answer, Chris, there you than you go. ever, We're good. ever All other questions, uh, answers will be shorter. Questions? Uh huh. there you go. He wants the prize. Go ahead. I don't want the prize. He already got the prize. Uh, one word I didn't hear you mention is ownership. And we're currently looking, at, and one of the big issues that I think a lot of people are dealing with is who owns the data when it's on the cloud. Uh, and if you look at the cable vision. It's a Facebook question. Right? Well, well, it's not just a Facebook question. I mean, you look at the cable vision case and some of the language and rhetoric we've heard out of MPAA and RIA surrounding the, the, the cable vision case and what are the implications of that. So can you talk about that and where you see that heading and what you think uh, the market reaction uh, of a, a negative decision by the Supreme Court, if it takes certain the cable vision case would be to the cloud? Well, we, we, we tend to frame that in the paper in terms of rights to same, the same issue, who has the rights to the data. And I, I think, again, it's an issue that is going to have to be addressed. It's complicated, certainly, and, and, and as you know, people are, you know, consumers are giving up certain rights, at least to share their data in exchange for other benefits. So that's where, not to reuse the cliche, but that's where transparency and accountability are going to have to be paramount. So that you, if you are giving up certain rights to, let's say, allow behavioral targeting, you need to know that and, and, and know what benefits you're getting uh, in return. Yeah, and I, and I suppose the, the thing you, you might say is that um, it, obviously it's an overused example to talk about the music industry and the RIAA in terms of what's happened to you know, an industry that until five, six, seven years ago was publishing compact discs that had no copy protection whatsoever, then went through a phase of trying to protect every disc so it could be ripped or burned and mixed only once. Now copy protection has not only come off CDs, but it's now come off everything, including MP3 files on iTunes, so Apple's given up on this. So the issue that we've seen play out in the music industry and then with other aspects of the media industries you mentioned now happening with film content, with video content, um, interestingly, what's, being play, what's playing out right now, we would argue, is now the third chapter. So first we dealt with music, now we're dealing with movies and books for very different reasons having to do with devices on the book side and movies on the broadband side, which are enabling both of those. But the ultimate question is who owns the information about me? And you could argue this is all a continuum of ownership rights. 
um, where we need to figure out how to pay content creators and at the same time respond to the fact that what the internet seems to be relentlessly driving for, relentlessly, relentlessly driving us towards, is the old hacker's adage, information wants to be free. And the question is how do the owners of information both protect it and get paid for it in appropriate ways. So I, mean, I think you put the picture on the complex issue that ought to have us rushing for the bulletproof limousine outside the door because this is an area of huge complexity. I think the one thing that we would say is whatever ownership is ultimately, ultimately defined, whether it's about intellectual property called cultural content or it's about personal information called my profile, one's ownership rights certainly should not change because it sits in the cloud, a public multi-tenant cloud, versus sitting on my own machine. That's the crucial issue going forward. Question over here. Yeah, um, with, I mean, with all due respect, I think framing the issue that was just put forward as an issue about rights really misses the point. There's a much broader issue about liability and what happens when somebody who uh, moves something into the cloud, uh, suddenly who takes responsibility for what's in the cloud? You know, if I send a package by FedEx, nobody expects FedEx to open my box, and services are shaping up in a way that expect online providers to be going through your stuff. And if you create a liability regime like that that puts that onus upon the service provider, uh, whether it's a cloud provider or even your ISP, uh, it's going to have a differential effect, right? It's going to advantage FedEx over the cloud. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that takes place in the context of these IP issues, but it's not limited to IP. It's limited to all sorts of things. Uh, content. That's not really a question, it's a comment, which I agree issue. with. Yes, I mean, we were just saying that it's, it's a, I mean, you, you, you should have a soapbox to stand on for a very simple reason. It's an incredibly important point. Thank you for raising it. In other words, in the world of telecommunications regulation, there's something known as common carriers. Common carriers are agnostic as to what runs through their pipes from an information standpoint, whether it's a twisted, twisted copper pair or a fiber optic system. That is the regime under which the regional bell operating companies and long lines providers have operated. We all know in the late 80s and early 90s, there were some very celebrated cases. I'm thinking of Prodigy Services in Germany, which all of a sudden was hosting chat rooms in which Nazi hate statements were being posted and Prodigy was held liable for allowing such content So the, just, to, just to repeat it for the you don't have a microphone, uh, our colleague pointed out that some ISPs then exited the German market because Prodigy was ultimately found by the German courts to be liable for hate speech, which was illegal by, under, under German law. We'd, of course, all agree with this philosophically, but if you look at Prodigy as an online service provider, it was a common carrier, and all of a sudden it was responsible for the content that it contained. So this, this issue then becomes a real question as we see, say, search engines in China, where Baidu is regularly censored by the Chinese government, where iTunes is censored because of certain cultural content by the Chinese government. This is a big question, which is, is, is it a common carrier regime or is it something different? And I think our colleague is saying, if you want the cloud actually to work, it's got to be something like a common carrier regime where the cloud provider, the multi-tenant or public provider, is limited in terms of legal liability. Hold on, one over here. Running, running, running. Hi. Um, question about uh, the application, one of the applications, potential applications of uh, cloud computing. What are the political implications for cloud computing, and the context is the Obama administration was extremely successful creating this 13 million plus uh, email network to help get elected. It looks like it's going to be a tool for governance as well, and what you're describing jumps way beyond uh, using cloud computing potential applications, and I'm just wondering about what are the political applications of uh, cloud computing? Well, um, gosh, uh I mean, it's here now, right? Um, you know, I can really uh, recommend um, uh, this book by Clay Shirky. Here comes everybody. How many people here are familiar with that book? A few folks. I mean, we'll have them on Federal News Radio in two weeks. So, there you go. Tia. So Thank forget, you. forget, forget the, the book. book. Right. To Chris. Exactly. Um, I, his point is that these kinds of technologies enable collaboration in a way at a far lower cost. I mean, essentially. And he uses a, kind of a very celebrated example of the uh, Catholic Church and priest uh, abuse in Boston, where it happened 20-some years ago, and it basically was kind of like a little scandal, and then it kind of died away. It happened again 20 years later, um, same sort of thing. People started creating news groups and posting around it and sharing, and it was uncontainable. And that's because 
the cost of being able to collaborate drops so much. It used to be if you wanted to collaborate, you had to go find somebody to print a newsletter and you get money and all that. Now it's you put it out into the, into the cloud environment. So um, I expect we're going to see enormous uh, changes uh, around this kind of stuff. The cost of collaboration is dropping dramatically. And if I can um, speak frankly, I'm not sure that everyone in uh, governmental institutions is going to be enthusiastic about that. Um, certainly in the case of uh, this thing in Boston, the Catholic Church wasn't that enthusiastic about it. So, you know, it's going to be a huge deal. Yeah, I'll tell I, you. I think maybe j just a couple of quick comments on that. I mean, I think it's a, it's a wonderful question and a wonderful point. I mean, I think one of the things we've learned is that a picture is probably worth a lot more than a thousand words. So whether it's, you know, the fact that you've been able to drop four Mentos into a two liter bottle of warm Diet Coke for about 20 years and create uh, something like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in your backyard, uh, everyone has known that. Everyone assumed it was an urban legend. Then it became a viral phenom on YouTube, and all of a sudden, it was a legal liability issue for Diet Coke. Mentos didn't mind because it doubled their marketing budget without spending an extra dollar. But that's a different story. A Dell with the so-called flaming laptop. Again, the ability to go to an open platform like YouTube and put up a picture of a flaming laptop in the middle of a conference like this. Um, you can talk all day long about how you, know, you were at a technology conference and some guy's laptop caught on fire, and it may sound very amusing or may sound very alarming. But man, when you see it in full motion video, it's both very entertaining and very alarming. Um, so you know, one of the things that, that from a government standpoint is what does that mean? It means not just radical transparency, but dramatic impact, um, as Bernard says, which changes the way in which the public is likely to respond to issues of all kinds. Um, you know, the, the, we don't see a lot about what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, if we did, we might feel differently. I was out at the Consumer Electronics Show to give just a concrete example in January, and one of the executives there was the, the head of C-SPAN. And C-SPAN, of course, is looking at the conversion to digital spectrum for broadcast television, which has been delayed but will happen, and essentially saying, my God, what this means is that we can cover everything that goes on in government, and we can do it in high definition. Over the last three years, Andrew's former network, CBS, has taken NCAA March Madness and made it possible to see every single game all the time from anywhere. So it's cloud-based March Madness. Um, that's a whole lot more visibility than we've ever had before. And by God, whether it's C-SPAN or the Obama administration, it's coming to government, it's coming to policy, and those different things, picture worth a thousand words, video most powerful medium ever invented, and radical transparency in high definition <coughs> for everything, that's a new reality, and it's got to change the game. And the other thing, uh, along the lines of the transparency a angles of this, I know there's, you know, everyone's talking and they're working very hard on the transparency aspects. Uh, it's going to be very interesting as some of the transparency parts come back and opponents use stuff that the Obama administration has posted in campaigns against them. Um, it, it was something that the Bush administration dealt with with their scorecards. How well are the agencies doing? Um, President Bush eventually decided that he was going to keep it public. So, Yeah, a, a very practical question about that. With the stimulus bill, you know, we're putting about $800 billion on the street, and um, it's being sent out to 50-some-odd states. and. Um, Beyond that, down to you know thirty thousand local jurisdictions. Um, a, a couple questions. One, is it, is it possible to track that spending with cloud computing? If so, how, how does that happen? Um, and, and then, what can be done? I, I anticipate strong institutional reluctance to participate in putting this. How do we create a platform where we shame? state and local officials into making this information transparent because the, the, you know, the, the normal guidelines that are coming out of the feds are one level of transparency, which is largely useless, and we've kind of got to hope people will do the right thing. How do we create an atmosphere where citizens are empowered to see the data, collaborate with it, and most importantly, the data is made available to them? What, how does that work? We've seen different levels of this. The state of Missouri has a whole portal where you can actually, and they're posting everything, but that was a 10-year process of them building frameworks and standards across how they spend money. So it, it's, it always sounds so, so I, I, easy I, and wonderful. I think it's a, great, it's a great example of the, great mar example. the market is going to drive that, in this case, the market of political opinion. The, the, the fact that a technology can enable something doesn't mean it necessarily happens. And in this case, I think it's going to be pressure from the electorate 
uh, to enable the technology to provide the kind of transparency you're talking about. But it's and very, I, I, it's I, I, very I, interesting how transparency and cloud computing are now almost be, being used interchangeably. Like you can't have transparency without the sort of enabling factors of cloud computing. And, and arguably vice versa. You can't have the enabling factors of cloud computing without I mean, it. It makes it so much more achievable and, and affordable. Um, but I would expect the, the new CIO, uh, uh, Vivek Khandra, whose whole mantra is making data available, um, is going to, you know, will have some um, influence and impact on that. And did a lot in D.C. If you've ever been to Apps for Democracy, you know, he actually made data sets available, open for, and uh, to quote Craig Newmark, freed the nerds and watch them all develop. Yeah, I think your point's right. I, I, in theory, as, as, as some jurisdictions start to do it, that will increase the pressure on others. Yeah, and yeah. I'm trying to think if, you know, there's one place a citizen can go to find out how the, you know, how the local county councilman is put, you know, $100,000 on the street. And people can do that all across the country and then say, oh, by the way, that $100,000 is going to the county councilman's brother-in-law um, and to root out waste, fraud, and abuse without some, some government official being responsible for it. Yeah. I have just one final comment because it's, it's a wonderful point and, and maybe just a case study, which is one of the beliefs that we came out of this work feeling very strongly about is that uh, while government should keep its hands off a lot of the aspects of what we're talking about, one way for government to lead is actually not to get pushed into this kind of transparency, but to adopt cloud services. Institutional adoption, as we call it, and you were very happy with how we phrased that. Right, so, so if we'd re written that uh, appropriately, it would have been modeling the desired behavior on the part of not just small individuals in small and medium-sized businesses or consumers, but to have large institutions like big government agencies start making use of the cloud and encounter these problems. Just one case study, which I think is an absolutely fascinating one, which maybe is a sign of how the, the problem you uh, becomes resolved. Uh, anyone here from Indianapolis? All right. Oh, we right have our Hoosier row. right here. So you're familiar with the, the Indianapolis has an absolutely spectacular art museum called the Indianas Indianapolis Museum of Art. It's on the former uh, campus or estate of the Lilly family of the Lilly Drug Company. It's an absolutely beautiful place. The director of the Whitney got hired as their director, a guy named Max Anderson. He moved out there a few years ago and he said, gee, you know, what's my goal? Serving the public. Um, I think serving the public means the museum should be free. Uh, so he made it free and visitorship quadrupled. This was a big news among museums across America who were worried that they're dying institutions and nobody's interested. At the same time, he said, wait a second, if I am not going to charge a gate fee, then I'm even more dependent on my development programs than ever. I need big donors, I need little donors, I need to play the Obama game. I need to do 13 million points of light with the 13 million email addresses. So one of the things you can find if you go to the website of the Indianapolis Museum of Art is the most, it's one of the most stunning examples I've seen of this kind of radical transparency enabled by the cloud. There's a dashboard and you can watch in real time how many people are walking to the museum today, what retail sales are like in the gift shop, how many dollars today? Dollars per square foot, dollars per minute. You can find out how the development program is going. You can find out how many pieces of art are in the collection, how many are on loan, how many special exhibitions. But you can find out how much they're spending on power and electricity in order to heat, air condition, and otherwise control lighting in the museum. And it looks like a bunch of widgets. If For those of you Mac users, if you use a site like NetVibes, it's a bunch of widgets that tell you every single thing you would want to know running that institution. And here's, here's the deal. The deal is, Previously, this was all privileged information. But if I'm turning to the community of Indianapolis or the United States to support my museum, this director says, I've got to share everything. Otherwise, how do you know that I'm using your $100 gift responsibly to run my museum? You could argue that that same kind of quid pro quo must exist for our government. And let's hope that the new administration is, in fact, hewing to a philosophy that looks a lot like that. But there's a case study there of an institution. Has it caught on? No, it's the only museum of Ameri in America that's doing it. Three years from now, will every major donor demand that kind of radical transparency? Maybe, and that's how some of this gets resolved. Yeah, one, two, three, we're back it up. Yeah, just short this is more of a security question, but if we want the government to actually be our partner in promoting this new cloud technology, through their policy, how are we actually going to convince them to use cloud because and making it more safe and secure for their own use? Our Fed's very nervous about the security aspects of cloud computing. Very, very nervous. I, I guess, uh, you know, in, in a way, Bernard, you're, you're probably the more technical expert. Let me just say something very quickly, which is that one of the things that the cloud should, in theory, be able to prove 
is that it is actually, that is a public cloud is a more secure environment than a private cloud or meaning a private or proprietary data center or the machine sitting on your desktop at home or at work. The reason for this is that a data center with tens of thousands or in some of these big players of the Amazons and Googles of the world, and maybe I have as many as 100,000 servers in a data center, um, these servers are little commodity PCs. They fail. The estimates are in any big data center, about 5% of the machines in the data center are actually not operating. Um, the beauty of this is that it is such massive parallel processing power and therefore such massive redundancy with the ability of big enterprise to protect these facilities physically, I mean for physical security, to put them in remote places, to make sure that they're run in ways that are ultra secure with firewall or encryption technology that not, neither you nor I could afford to operate as individuals or as small or medium sized businesses. The ultimate dream of the cloud is that it's actually much more secure than current distributed computing systems. That's the case that the cloud needs to be able to make. And by the way, the DOD and the intelligence community are uh, actually using the cloud already, as you probably know. So they actually happen to be ahead of much of the government in, in, in some of these experiments, which is encouraging. Well, and whenever somebody asks me those questions, I always say, compared to what? Because they say, well, this is a risk. Well, compared to what? I, I, it was amazing. I had a comment on one of my blog postings. Somebody said, what's to protect somebody at Amazon from dumping your data onto a thumb drive and walking out with it? And it's kind of like, well, what's to protect that same type of person in your own data center from doing it? And typically, I mean, if, if, from my perspective, I'm more confident that Amazon's going to have the right practices and policies in place than I am about Joe Blow's data center. But so and your question was, what can the government do around it? And you know, my response would be to, to engage and embrace and start working with it to flesh those things out and s solve the problems. And, and I mean, the, one of the interesting the, uh, enablers of cloud computing is we all remember the VA laptop that uh, got stolen from some person's house. Uh, this person had 23 million records for vets on it. Um, this poor person was actually working on those uh, those data records, um, but we still had to fire him. Um, but regardless, if that had been enabled in a cloud, some kind of cloud format, uh, you know, he wouldn't have had to carry it all on a thumb drive. So. Uh, uh, ended up being in a format that no one could access yeah. anyway, but whatever. Government. Yes, I have a policy question. Um, you talked about U.S. leadership in, uh, in terms of technology and, and, and starting this concept of the cloud, um, but you also talked about data now flowing not just around the U.S., but also around the whole world. You talked about data centers going to Switzerland, possibly giving Switzerland uh, regulatory jurisdiction over data centers. Um, what we're also seeing is uh, a struggle or um, demand by governments around the world to, to be more involved in ICANN. We're seeing the ITU wanting to be more involved. We heard an OECD representative saying, ooh, cloud, uh, cloud computing, the OECD should take up this concept. Do we see a potential here for the cloud to enable a massive shift of power away from the United States towards international organizations, and if so, what does the U.S. need to do to, to keep the leadership that it has? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Well, I, I'll, I'll try. I mean, so first of all, it, it's, there, it's there. a phenomenal yeah. question, and I mean, just, just the quick thing, this is the, the give, you know, the, I'm going to prepare this for Andrew's uh, definitive answer. Um, we have seen this before. Uh, just the way we've seen the question of data privacy before, and it's you know it started with the web in the mid '90s, which is you know was there what we call nexus, just a simple thing like a sales tax issue. If I have a server in Massachusetts and make an e-commerce sale in West Virginia, uh, I don't think there's any question about the fact that this is a challenge to national sovereignty on the level of legal and regulatory regimes. Does it mean that this new medium homogenizes the world? and creates all of a sudden a role for Ban Ki-moon that nobody ever dreamed of for the head of the United Nations, I think that would be a very radical statement. On the other hand, your points stand. Every one of them is based in fact and logic, which is to say that on one hand, the medium is literally global, and any task or any information record, any personal profile, or any single from Beyonce, speaking of cultural content, uh, may live in multiple parts, in multiple packets, across multiple servers, in multiple data centers, in multiple regimes, some of which are at the state level in the United States, but increasingly, as this becomes a global phenomenon, will live all over the world. And we are going to need to figure out how to do that, and it's going to drive unprecedented forms of 
international or global cooperation to resolve these issues. I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah, so I, I agree. And I, I think that one of the things in thinking about these issues, they're complex. You have to kind of embrace the contradictions and the ambiguities. The, the, there does have to, it has to be a global phenomenon in order to succeed, uh, that by definition. Uh, so there is going to have to be some kind of cooperation, not only among states, but among, um, among agencies. I, to answer your question, I think the, the, the U.S. leads by being the place where the technology leader, where the cloud ecosystem really flourishes. Where, so I, I think the, that's where you come back to the tension between government or agency level and market. And to the degree that the U.S. can be the technology leader, that's where we think the big U.S. opportunity is, not by closing off the American cloud from international cooperation, because that, by definition, defeats the whole purpose. I'm going to do three quick questions and then three quick answers. Okay, I'll try to make this quick. I write for the Chronicle of Higher Education, and I'm curious, you, you've basically said, as I've heard you, that government should sort of uh, get out of the way a little bit as far as regulation, and there's a role for government in sort of leading by buying commercial cloud services, but is there a role, the government has invested quite a bit, U.S. government has invested in cyber infrastructure, I think is the buzzword right now, um, at universities and other places to develop uh, supercomputing centers that are now being turned into a cloud model, and from what I'm hearing. So I'm curious whether government has a role in offering cloud services and maybe leading by actually uh, oh, yeah, offering if, things if, that aren't. We, if we weren't clear about that, I'm sorry, absolutely. And I think, and we also think that your example is great, that government funded research on the cloud, especially in areas where corporations might not choose to invest, is also going to be critical. And, and just, just the other point, I mean, especially seconds, from an educational perspective, I mean, we all know that one of the reasons Google is able to attract top talent is because they're looking at 120 million unique visitors a month on top of the world's most powerful computing infrastructure. That attracts talent the same way CERN in Switzerland with those linear accelerators attract talent. So in other words, we can create magnets in this country, especially from a research, a university research, an educational a think tank, an R&D perspective, we can create magnets by having the world's superior computing infrastructure. It helps to have it and talent always shows up. If I can just uh, follow up on that, so Educause is the is the sort of the IT uh, thing for uh, universities. They've um, the guy who runs their uh, CIO summit uh, asked me to come and speak at their next uh, summit event because he said this is a huge deal for us. We got to figure out how to do it. So I, I mean I think there's a um, strong strong interest and strong case for it. Uh, great, thank you. Um, with mass amounts of data being added to the cloud every day, what technologies and innovations do you think will help us sift through all of it? Do you think the promise of semantic web and movements in computational linguistics will hold promise? I think maybe the short answer is yes, um, which is simply to say that... Which, that which summarizes our knowledge of the topics that you... Uh... Yeah, no, no, <laughs> in, in, in all seriousness, I mean, you know, one of the reasons that the page rank algorithm is significant or that dig.com is significant or that social bookmarking and tagging is significant is that all of us now, again, live not in a world of information scarcity, but we're beyond what Richard Saul Werman called 25 years ago information anxiety. We're now in information overload state, and I suspect that all of us drink heavily at night because we have no idea what to do with what's coming into our inbox, let alone what's happening on our Facebook or MySpace page. So the idea idea that there is a set of entrepreneurial opportunities to filter, to select, to curate appropriate information. I mean, I think we'd argue that a lot of startups are attempting to do that today. Social filters, as you might call them, like dig communities are doing that today. But this is a big deal. It's actually a great point that with the ubiquity of information and with it more connectedness, there's going to be more of a demand for ways to sort through it and organize your informational uh, landscape. And it is sobering to think that five years ago we used to talk about you know one other law, which was how rapidly the world's supply of information was doubling, and we're now under a year. The cloud, to your point, is only going to accelerate that. So, big issue. Back here in the back. Last question. Um, well, I have two more. You have two more. Yeah. Thank you. Higher education again. It seems that the cloud can fundamentally transform how we deliver higher education in the United States and that perhaps colleges and universities as we know them today may not be as necessary, at least in a brick and mortar fashion, aside from having NCAA scores to watch. <laughs> so I was wondering if you talk a little bit about how you see the cloud sort of transforming our delivery of higher education in the United States. Uh, and I was doing a panel yesterday on uh, 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 distance learning and all the just incredible innovations coming in that area. 
Uh, it's, it's an absolutely wonderful question. Uh, you know, I mean, you look at the growth of University of Phoenix or the value of some of these publicly traded companies like Capella, which are offering online learning. Uh, there is no question that uh, the enlightened university presidents across the country are asking themselves whether they run an educational institution or a theme park for adults. And depending on the answer, to that, and I'm not kidding, I mean, depending on the answer to that question, you do very different things with your brick and mortar facilities. All of MIT's curriculum, for example, every damn last course offering is now available from the cloud. So I think it puts institutions, especially of higher education, um, in this interesting role of asking the question, what will be the new division of labor within the world of delivery of educational services between what technology can and should mediate and what needs to be high touch, high bandwidth? I mean, I don't think anyone's missing the, the, the you know, in a sense, the irony of your question. We, sitting in this room in a face-to-face -face conversation, are experiencing the highest definition, highest bandwidth connectivity of all. And the question is, which aspects of educational experience need to be high touch, high bandwidth, meaning face-to-face, -face, and what can be streamed? The cloud really frames the need in a very bright line way uh, to divide the labor between those two intelligently as we move forward. But it's, and it's interesting because Chris Anderson, uh, the editor of Wired, was speaking at Fosse last week and talking about how increasingly students, are, all they really want their university to provide are, is the pipe so they can connect to the rest of the world and, and so they can print. And that's what they're looking for. And, uh... Uh, yes, well, uh, like... Jeffrey's former colleague uh, sort of, uh, I think, is forecasting the, uh, uh, Clayton Christensen, um, is sort of forecasting that it's, higher education is, is ripe for disruption. And you know, 10 years from now, it'll look very different. I have a friend who was a business professor at a, kind of a liberal, one of the kind of traditional liberal arts colleges. He sort of ticks off his university president because he says, well, what we ought to be doing is selling off the, the complex and returning all the money because we aren't going to be relevant in 20 years. He's very popular, staff. <laughs> yeah, one can only imagine. Yes, I'd like to ask a counterintuitive question about public clouds and private clouds. And I think uh, I appreciated your taxonomy. And now sort of everyone is a cloud uh, provider. And so it means sort of everything and nothing. And you hear lots of discussion about the vagaries associated with the public cloud. But, oh, I'm going to build a private cloud because that's the security that the government needs or whomever. And uh, so that private cloud is uh, maybe it'll be over private network because the internet's too risky, and maybe it'll be single tenant because uh, you don't want commingled data, and maybe it won't allow for web mashups because then you bring in viruses, and you sort of go down that path, and it's oh, well, this is an ASP hosted model that failed in the 90s. So I would actually posit that there is a lot more reality and understanding of what the public cloud is. And the private cloud at this point is a total fiction. And I would be interested in your commentary on that because the discourse is, of, is often the opposite. Yeah, I, I, I love that question because what you might say is the private cloud is a total fiction because living inside a walled garden is a bad strategy for any organization that needs to learn for a living from what's happening in the world and what information is flowing around the world at any given time. So, you know, classic example of a walled garden, Lotus Notes as groupware. Lotus Notes is a dead platform. Why? Because it's a walled garden. AOL used to be a walled garden. It is now a dying company. So I think the interesting point, if I understand your question, is um, sure, theoretically and practically, we can build private clouds. The question is, do companies or organizations or government agencies that rely on private clouds that are sealed off from the public network and therefore the public clouds, do they actually have the nourishment in information flows to remain competitive? I think our view is uh, closed systems ultimately are dead. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but the day after that and for the rest of our lives, to you know, borrow the phrase from you know, Rick's Cafe. Oh, it's a fascinating question. Last question. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to know your, and hear your perspective on um, what the opportunities for cloud adoption are in healthcare, and particularly for hospitals. This is obviously an area in which privacy and security are paramount, and um, I think there are a lot of rich opportunities for adoption, but in terms of convincing hospitals that this is an, an okay route for them to go down, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do you want to say that? Well, I was just going to say uh, there's a couple of uh, HIPAA compliant uh, offerings up on um, Amazon. So, you know, there's ways to address it. So there's, you know, this sort of goes back to the political thing, I, in my view. You know, it's kind of, um, there's folks who say, you know, this could be 
a lot more effective. And, um, and I think that it's fair to say that most ho uh, healthcare IT is not that strong. Um, they sort of focus more on fixing patients than they do on fixing their IT. Um, so I think, you know, but I, I don't think that it's impossible to get those kind of privacy things. And what I was going to say about the whole private cloud is, you know, I, to me it's the data. What, what about the data? And I think that we might see something, kind of what we pump for is something called like a virtual private cloud. Because we have virtual private networks. You run it across the internet, but it's, it's congealed in a way that it keeps it secure. And I can see very much the same thing around cloud. I'm going to leverage the infrastructure that's out there, but I'm going to have the stuff that I need walled off for my legal or regulatory reasons, given that the government steps forward and gets that, and that's right? So, that, I'm Se sorry. Separates it off. And then for the stuff that doesn't need to be that way, I leverage the other part of the cloud. But I, I think there's huge opportunities for healthcare, and they ought to be going that way because, um, you know, hospitals. I, I just don't think that you know, sort of the, oh, we're ready to upgrade the next platform. I need another twelve million dollars, is going to fly. It's a great question to end on because healthcare illustrates to me all the potential and all the issues that have to be addressed yeah. um, in the extreme. In the extreme, it, it is. It could just be transforming, but. Obviously, privacy, reliability, security, all the things we talked about are going to be critical in terms of institutional and consumer adoption and trust. But I, I, I think that, I'm so glad you raised it because we, we do address it probably not in as much length as we should in the paper. That's an area where uh, you, know, you could really see the dream of the cloud. And, and just, a, sure. just a quick parting shot on that. I mean, as, as you're implying, I suspect, with your question, electronic medical records have been a dream of the healthcare industry for, what, at least 25 years? Yeah and now are in some ways mandated. Uh, so we all know that we need to get there and- uh, so far as, beyond that, to, so just you know, collaboration and you're starting to see this also on treatments, even on surgery, on you know, getting expertise from another part of the world in real time. You hear, you know, it's, it's got tremendous potential. Yeah, so I mean, I think the key point to make and it's relevant to much more than healthcare um, is that yes, companies like Amazon and Google, as, as Bernard is pointing out, are obviously pushing into personal medical records, electronic medical records, they have different names for this. I think the one point we've not addressed is that um, this is, as Andrew says, the most extreme version of these questions about does my personal information belong to me? And one of the things we haven't talked about is, you know, things like, though some of you may be familiar with, open ID and other forms of what some people call cryptolopes that can package the individual's personal information in a way that it is accessible to people who can do something for the individual, like make a diagnosis or you know, review a 10-year history dealing with a certain diagnosis. But at the same time, um, a doctor can walk into a room and have a face-to-face -face interaction with the patient without the patient or the doctor knowing either one of their identity. So the issue here, and it's one that a very interesting startup company, and maybe just something to end up with another cloud service called Sermo that is based up in Cambridge, Mass, now has 105,000 physicians who are part of a physicians-only social network. The only way to enter the social network is to actually have a U.S. medical license. And these physicians are talking to one another about us. Now, that's interesting for a couple reasons. One is, Sermo is only three years old and already it has more active members than the American Medical Association. So 105,000 physicians out of about 800,000 total. The second is, the physicians, in effect, by discussing our case histories, are sharing patient personal information with one another. But for a dermatologist to put a JPEG online and say, I've got a patient with a very odd looking rash, um, could the 35 expert dermatologists at top tier universities weigh in in the next 60 minutes and help me make a differential diagnosis? That does not require that physician to reveal anything about the patient's individual identity, but you do crowdsource expert wisdom in the solution of the problem. So I think one of the issues here is going to be as much about social networks and the Beacon program at Facebook as about healthcare. How do we separate the personal profile from the actual identity information? What a wonderful place to end. Let me give you your copy.